And I'll just note that I have our eldest daughter, who is eight and a half. She's one of these, I, I know, you, you know you're sick and tired of hearing people brag about their kids, so I'm not going to dwell on this. However, she's one of these super duper advanced, you know, she's like in the 57th grade sort of thing. You know, and when she was seven, the school just finally said, all right, obviously she's reading at some zillionth grade level, so let's, let's <laughs> we'll show this kid. They, they gave her Little Women, which is like this thick. So she read the whole thing, and they quizzed her and tested her, and she got all of it right, and she remembered it, and there's no problem. Well, right around that time, she was really starting to ask her father, what are your books about? Like, what is in Daddy's books? I read all these other books, you know, I know all about Daffy Duck and everything else, now what's in your books? And I would say to her, well, you know, I'd love to share this with you, and I can't wait for you to get a little older, and we can share this together, it'll be great. No, oh, she's just not accepting this at all. No, j explain it to me and I'll understand. Well, finally, after she read Little Women, she more or less came to me and very gently and more, more or less diplomatically said to me, look, Dad, I just read Little Women. I mean, how hard could nullification be? <laughs> so I sat down with her and I thought, I'm going to try to explain this. Because the thing is, she is sort of politically aware just through osmosis, just listening to her father, blah, 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 to her mother all the time. And so, for example, this is not, I don't have to make it, in my household, I don't have to make up stories, right? We have perfectly spontaneous things occurring all the time. And one of them was not long ago, somebody knocked on the door, my wife answered it, and by the time our daughter Regina came in to find out who it was, it was already gone, and she said to my wife, who was that at the door? My wife said, oh, it was somebody asking for money. And I kid you not, our daughter Regina said, don't tell me the IRS was at the door. <laughs> like, how, like, how would she think? I don't know. Well, what I do for a living, basically, is I become a myth buster. And sometimes I say, I would like to pump gas for a living. I'd like to live in a society where I don't have any myths to debunk, where people are taught real American history, where we're not taught a lot of phony baloney nonsense. I'd like to live in that country, and I would, it would be an honor to pump gas in that country. But until we're living in that country, I'm doing this. And I've been writing books for some time, and that's pretty much what I do. And people, how could you write so many books? Well, when you have no social life and you don't sleep, you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish. <laughs> so 2004, I had this book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. And the response from the New York Times was, they were appalled. How dare I say some of the things in that book? But what was revealing is that when the New York Times attacked me for that book, they did so not in the book review section. That would have been flattering enough. They attacked me in a signed editorial on the editorial page, solemnly warning the American public about this book. <laughs> Copies of which, by the way, are available at my table. And of course, what do you suppose happened when that attack came out? Of course, sales psh, right through the, the roof, of course, because all normal Americans immediately thought, wow, what has got the New York Times all worked up? I've got to get a copy of this book. So ever since then, the New York Times has just ignored me. Like, that's the approach now, which I have to hand it to them. That's much smarter than what they did before. But that's really what sort of put me on the map. And I realized when that book did so well, you know, I, was just a, I was just some professor somewhere, and up to that point, I've written books that more or less other professors might buy, and you know, if you sell 50 copies, you have a big bash, and even though you yourself secretly bought 25 of them just to make it look respectable. So this was just a shot out of the blue, and when I saw the, how it resonated, I thought, all right, there is a market for that. P people are just sick of it. They don't believe what the official opinion molders are telling them. They don't believe what the official information transmission channels are telling them. Well, all right, well then I want to keep doing this, and somehow I've kind of made a kind of career out of talking about forbidden things or things they don't want us talking about. And that's what I'm talking about tonight, is a topic they don't want us talking about. And that's this, that's this topic of nullification that you're going to hear talked about a lot more because there are a lot of frustrated Americans. I agree completely that we've got a lot of frustrated Americans, but not just frustrated Americans, but Americans who feel like we've already tried all the other things. Like we've already tried every, you know, I've written to my congressman. I called up my congressman, I said, I think you're a bum, and you know, it doesn't say, gives me slight satisfaction, but I'm not seeing results here. What can we do other than this? 
and suddenly people are peering into the long neglected Thomas Jefferson toolkit and they're looking for things that might work. Now some of these things like nullification, I have to warn you, are not approved by the New York Times. <laughs> and in fact what I tell you tonight does not fall inside that box that all good Americans are supposed to confine themselves to. We're supposed to be in that box and you all know it, it goes from Joe Biden to Mitt Romney. You're allowed to be somewhere in there but if you stray a little bit over here, citizen, be careful, be careful, you're not respectable. Well, my view is, as I've said repeatedly, that it's our job as good and decent Americans to crush that box into the ground and then set it on fire. So now back to my daughter. I talked to her finally about nullification. I thought, all right, well, look, you know, she's got me, right, with that, <laughs> that line about little women. What am I going to do? So I explained it to her this way. I said, in the Constitution, which she kind of knew what that was, I said, there's a list. They made a list of things that the government in Washington could do. I didn't say Article 1, Section 8, but it's a list of things. And I kid you not, her first instinct was to ask me, but what if they do something that's not on the list? I said, oh man, you're just, my heart's melting here. That's just beautiful. <laughs> I said, well, you know what? You're walking right into it because that's exactly what nullification is. That's when the states say, now wait a minute, we didn't put this on the list, so we're not doing it. And she got it immediately. So I thought to myself, my seven, because she was seven when I explained this to her, I thought, my seven-year-old kid is better than all the Supreme Court justices put together. <laughs> I can't believe my good fortune to have, the, now I realized I wasn't setting the bar particularly high for my daughter when I did that. <laughs> but she got it, right? She got this, because it's not that hard to understand. And what she found hard to understand was that anyone would think this was controversial. Well, of course, if they do something not on the list, of course you shouldn't do it. Well, I, I said, well, look, yeah, I know, look, should be obvious, right? We live in a crazy place, okay? But it's, you're, what your daddy's trying to do is make it obvious again. Because George Orwell once said that it is the duty of honest men, sometimes it devolves upon them, the duty of repeating the obvious. Well, here we are, when you live in an insane, like, it's the society we're in, it's a, it's a combination between an Orwell novel and a Kafka novel. And when you're in that society, stating the obvious becomes a revolutionary act. So what is this thing? Well, to make a long story extremely short, it basically boils down to this. In 1798, we had some offensive legislation that was signed into law by John Adams called the Alien and Sedition Acts. I will dwell just for a moment only on the Sedition Act, which made it a crime to be critical of the President or the Congress, and to be excessively critical. Now notice they, they skipped over somebody. They skipped over the vice president. Because at that time, the top vote getter becomes the president. The second place finisher becomes the vice president. So John Adams is the president, belonging to the Federalist Party. party. Thomas Jefferson is the vice president. He belongs to the Republican Party. The Federalists dominate the executive branch, the Congress, and the courts. So you can't criticize the president or the Congress, but they jump right over Thomas Jefferson, the vice president. You can say anything you want to about him under the law. So Jefferson thought, you know, look, I'm, I'm not really that stupid, right? I mean, like, I see this is obviously a partisan measure designed to hurt my party. And sure enough, influential Republican newspaper editors were being tossed into, in jail. People making what by today's standards are astonishingly restrained comments about John Adams are being fined or imprisoned. There was a U.S. congressman from Vermont who went to jail. This was a guy who had fought in the American Revolution. He was sent to jail for saying something, again, totally harmless about John Adams. Although I am happy to report that the thousand dollar fine he had to pay was actually paid for by his constituents who took up a collection for him and then proceeded to re-elect him for another term from jail. <laughs> Say, those are the Americans, okay? Those are the, you know, they, they are our forefathers. Those are the ones we need to remember and emulate. So Jefferson thought, well, I don't think you can just, I'm not going to say, look, it was fun having a constitutional government, but all good things must come to an end. I mean, something, we have to, something has to be done about this. What are we going to do? Well, we could wait two years for the next presidential election, but again, and I, I, I hate to say things 
that, that uh, fall outside that box. But, you know, once in a while you notice a presidential election doesn't yield you, you know, the results you might have been looking for. We'll just put it that way. So, and plus, by then, we might all be in jail. Like, we can't wait for two years. Well, it's ridiculous. Or we could refer this to the Supreme Court, right? Have the Supreme Court look at it. Well, the Supreme Court did not actually hear any cases pertaining to this, but if they had, they would have supported the Sedition Act because all the justices were appointed by Federalists. And in fact, a good number of the states, including my home state of Massachusetts, said that the sedition law was most excellent. It's about time we have this thing to stop all these scurrilous things being said about our wise president. So, <laughs> good old Massachusetts, screwing up the country for 200 years. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I'm so, look, I'm so, I, I come here from Massachusetts. I mean, I don't live in Massachusetts anymore, but boy, do we have a lot to answer for. So I don't want, people come to me and say, oh, I'm from such and such state, and I'm so sorry that we produce such and such politician. And I just sit there and feel like I, I can't even say a word. Like, what can I even say to these poor people? So Jefferson, so what are we going to do? So the Supreme Court is not going to work, but even if it would work, in the sense that it might give you the ruling you want, from Jefferson's point of view, the, f the federal government is the problem. The Supreme Court is a branch of the problem. You don't refer a dispute like this between the states and the federal government to the federal government. It would be like you and I are having a dispute and I say, oh, I have just the impartial arbiter for this, my mother. <laughs> All right, she's a fair-minded, wonderful woman. And I'm not just saying this because I have no idea what YouTube channel this might wind up on someday. <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't bet my life that she's going to vote against me. So Jefferson's view was, no, 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 that, the, the, the federal courts are a party to one of the sides. You know, like they, they, they're one of the parties in this contest. You can't refer it to them. It doesn't even make sense. No, no, no. In this case, the states are the proper disputants. As the states confer among themselves and ask, did we intend to delegate this power to the federal government? Those are the proper disputants. And that was Jefferson's view. That was James Madison's view as he wrote in the famous report of 1800, sometimes called the Virginia Report. He said, it's not the case, I'm paraphrasing, he said, it's not the case that our presidents are fallible, our congressmen are fallible, but our judges are divine. That's not our system. He says, to the contrary, all three branches can betray us. And so there needs to be a last resort mechanism when we've been betrayed by everybody. And that mechanism consists of the parties to the Constitution themselves, namely the states, having a last resort no. That's what Jefferson called nullification. He introduced that word into the American political vocabulary. Now, when you are attacked and smeared for talking about nullification, I can almost guarantee you, it's not an ironclad guarantee, but it's like 90% guarantee that the people attacking you will not dare mention Thomas Jefferson's name. Because they know if people get the idea that Jefferson thought this, maybe it might give them ideas. Well, gee, Jefferson wasn't exactly a slouch. If Jefferson came up with this, maybe we might use this today. So therefore, Jefferson just falls out of the historical picture. No mention of him. But, you know, I like to, just to drive them crazy, I'm just going to say, Jefferson, 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 it was his idea. Okay? So I don't care that it's the whole political class and the whole media class and that it's Rachel Maddow and Keith Olbermann, wherever he wound up, and, and Bill O'Reilly and all of them against Thomas Jefferson and me. I used to, you know, it's like me and Will Chamberlain scored two, you know, 102 points together. It's one of those things, you know, Jefferson's doing most of the legwork here. But I still feel like the odds are pretty good, and we got him in our corner. So Jefferson drafts the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. Madison drafts the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. And they're basically saying the states have to do this. They're duty-bound, said Madison, duty-bound to interpose between the federal government and the people. He didn't say, well, you know, maybe they might think about interposing or it might be a good idea if it's a half moon or something. They're duty bound to interpose. That's strong language. Now, in the year 1998, you would think there would have been a big celebration in Washington commemorating these documents. But you know what? Surprisingly, there was not a word. Not a word. We have to find out about them on our own. Now, where did Thomas Jefferson get this idea from, though? I mean, maybe he was just, you know, maybe we're just taking one, we're cherry-picking one thing that Jefferson thought, 
and maybe he was drunk and he woke up hungover and he said, thought to himself, oh my gosh, I hope I, didn't, hope I didn't publicize nullification while I was drunk the other night. And then he realized, oh no, it's already been published. It was not that. To the contrary, Jefferson, although he's the one who introduces the word, was really just channeling an idea that goes back at least 10 years earlier to the ratifying convention in Virginia. So the Constitution's drafted in 1787, then as you know, it goes out to the states, and there were skeptics in some of those state ratifying conventions. They're skeptical of the Constitution. They think this Constitution is going to grant this federal government all kinds of crazy powers. Because they say, look at all these open-ended phrases in it, like general welfare, or necessary and proper, and so on and so forth. Or even the supremacy clause there was some concern about. And what happened in Virginia? Well, first of all, remember, Virginia is a very populous state, very important and influential. So many important statesmen come from Virginia. It matters what's said there. And Patrick Henry said at that ratifying convention, I'm concerned about this Constitution. Because that general welfare clause, every tyrant says that all the things he's doing are for the general welfare. That's no, this, we have no guarantee this thing isn't going to do all kinds of, commit all kinds of enormities against us. And so Edmund Randolph stood up and said, you don't have anything to worry about because this is a limited government of enumerated powers. And so no phrase like that can amount to an additional delegation of power. The delegation of power is spelled out clearly. We have, we've got all these things the federal government can do. And he even said that the federal government will have only those powers that are expressly delegated. So he used even stronger language than would be used in the Tenth Amendment a little while later. He used expressly delegated. In fact, at least half a dozen ratifying conventions used that phrase, expressly delegated. And what matters when you're interpreting the Constitution is what did the ratifiers think? That's what Madison said. And that's what Jefferson said. You want to know what the Constitution means, you go and see what its friends said that it meant. Well, what did its friends say that it meant in Virginia? Well, Edmund Randolph said it means that it's got only these powers expressly delegated. Edmund Randolph became first uh, a U.S. Attorney General. And then George Nicholas, who became Attorney General of Kentucky, said in the Virginia Ratifying Convention that if the federal government should attempt to impose upon the states any supplementary condition, that is to say anything over and above what we gave it the power to do in the Constitution, Virginia will be exonerated from it. Well, that's pretty darn close to nullification without using the word. Now, who was George Nicholas? Though? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm cherry-picking him. Maybe he was some drunk who stumbled into the proceedings. Well, it turns out that not only was he the, the future Attorney General of Kentucky, but he and Randolph together sat on the five-man commission whose job it was to draft the ratification instrument of Virginia, the document by which Virginia would enter the Union. So their opinions pretty much are the opinions of Virginia about the significance of their ratification. That they're just ratifying a document with some specified powers in it, and if it tries to exercise some supplementary power, well, Virginia won't have to do it. That's what Jefferson's appealing to 10 years later. Patrick Henry referred to this again in 1790. John Taylor of Caroline in his pamphlets was talking about it all through the 1790s, and it culminates in the great Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. Now, sure, you can get the Virginia-Kentucky Resolutions maybe mentioned in passing and usually misleadingly in a U.S. history textbook. But the rest of this stuff I just told you, the number of textbooks that mention this or American history classes in this country that mention this, I mean, you can to say you can count them on one hand, I mean, you could count them on, like, one, if I cut off my hand, I could still count them. And, and, and no, I wouldn't have to count to one. Let's imagine I've got no hand at all. Right? I mean, none of this stuff. No, just nothing. Nothing. So. I'll tell you a quick thing about myself. I stink at almost everything. I'm a bad plumber. I'm a bad carpenter. I'm a bad fix-it man. I have no idea how my car works. As far as I know, there's a little angel in there that makes it go. I don't understand anything. The, the only thing I can do is write history. That's the only thing I can do. That's my contribution to this. That's all I can do. I'm not a strategist. I'm not an organizer. I'm terrible at everything else. My handwriting is bad. I mean, really, I could just go on and on. This is the one thing I can do. Because I feel like whatever else, whatever other tools we may need to turn things around, one of them is going to be knowledge. And uh, I am not going to let all those rotten books that I had to read through all those years of graduate school go to waste. I'm going to put them to some use and, and, and do this stuff. So I decided when I saw one day that there were some Tea Party groups that were linking to my videos on nullification, 
But they were, I was given talks on nullification just because I'm a historian. I talk about old things. They were linking to them because they thought, hey, this sounds pretty good. Why don't we do it now? And I thought in my wildest dreams, I never thought anyone would talk like this uh, again. So I wrote a book called Nullification. I thought, as soon as you start talking about this, you talk about the states, whatever, you're going to be smeared. They're going to call you names. You probably are racist. They're like, we've all heard all the usual things you get called, right? I mean, you can't, no one wants to have an actual argument with you because they fear they might lose. So they just try to call you these career destroying names. Well, I'll tell you, it hasn't destroyed my career. <laughs> call me anything you want, but. Uh, what I have done is I've, I've made myself sort of bulletproof by going through, I mean, it was not easy going through Harvard and Columbia surrounded by dopes constantly who think they're little geniuses, 18-year-old snotballs who have read one article on something and think they're experts on it now. That was tough. So I'm not going to let that go to waste. My intention is I'm going to take their credentials and use them against those institutions and make them regret they ever admitted me to those colleges. <laughs> So I wanted to do this because I thought, if people want to do this, they're going to be called all kinds of names. I want to arm people with the arguments for this because the arguments are overwhelming. Historical arguments, constitutional arguments, strategic arguments, moral arguments, they're all there. But the beautiful thing about it, see, I don't design any of my book covers because that's another thing I stink at. So I was thrilled to see the way they designed the freaking cover because look at it. It's, I mean, it's a little bit distant, so I'm going to describe it to you. So here's, we got picture of Obama with uh, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and Chris Dodd and some others with the word nullification stamped over their heads. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> the beauty of this on the part of my publishers, it doesn't matter if you know what the concept of nullification is. You take one look at this and you say, whatever this thing is, I like it already. All right. So what so when you go through and you look at the history, you find that ten, not 10 years later, the New England states are all up in arms. How dare Virginia and Kentucky talk this way about our wise overlords in Washington? How dare they suggest that they might be able to resist something that comes down from them? How dare they? But not 10 years later, the New England states are using the same language. Not 10 years later. So I don't care that in 1798 they weren't on board because actions speak louder than words. And already in 1807, they're chafing under what they consider to be federal oppressions, whether it's the, the Jefferson embargo, whether it's unconstitutional searches and seizures, they are appealing to this language. I put in here, I like to put documents sometimes. In this book, I got a lot of documents so that you don't have to take my word for it. One document is a speech by the governor of Connecticut in 1809. Governor of Connecticut. Now, when was the last time we ever thought a governor of Connecticut did anything that we would not cringe to hear about? But here's a go governor, Jonathan Trumbull, who's, who reminded the legislature that it devolves upon the states in the last resort. When the federal government has usurped powers, it devolves upon the states to be the sentinels of the liberties of the people. Now, a year or two ago, there, well, I guess two years ago now, there was an election in, in Connecticut for attorney general. And the Republican candidate during the, during the debate, pulls out this book and quotes from Jonathan Trumbull from 200 years ago. She says, you know, we need people in the state right now who will talk like this. Well, they went up one side of her and down the other because she had for, he, she'd committed the unforgivable sin. And I don't mean the unforgivable sin of the Christian tradition because, you know, you know the people we're talking about, these are not exactly the most devout in the world. No, the unforgivable sin is to break out of the Biden to Romney box. And Biden doesn't say nullification is okay, neither does Mitt Romney, so we don't even have to refute you. It's just enough to say you've strayed from the box. They don't refute you. They don't bother. They can't. They have no arguments. Usually what they'll say, what the New York Times has done to me and others, is just to quote and say, look, hey, he says so-and-so. Yep, I do. I do say so-and-so, and I got a lot of proof for that statement, too. Doesn't matter. You've strayed. Well, we have to stray. We have to be proud of being strays. And as history goes on, we see other states making this appeal. In 1820, the legislature of Ohio passes a resolution saying, we believe a majority of Americans have adopted these great principles of 1798. In the 1850s, Wisconsin's Supreme Court cheered what its state legislature had done. What had its state legislature done? It had declared that notwithstanding the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution, that the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 had in many particulars gone beyond what that authorized and was 
unauthoritative, void, and of no force, and not to be enforced in Wisconsin, and its state Supreme Court cheered that on. Now, again, how often is that talked about in class? Right? Never. I mean, there were handbills passed around in Wisconsin saying, in order to protect these free men, these former slaves, we must appeal to our state sovereignty. Now, isn't that the exact opposite of what we normally hear? Is that state sovereignty is just a cloak for slavery? What? To the contrary, when South Carolina seceded December 20th, 1860, one of its complaints was it was sick and tired of the North doing so much nullifying. When Jefferson Davis gave his farewell address in the U.S. Senate, he criticized the North for nullifying. So this is not some Confederate idea. Because that's, of course, that's the worst thing you can accuse anybody of, is, is that. It's not a Southern idea, and it's not a Northern idea. It's an American idea that appeared all throughout the country in all regions for all different reasons. And it's something that I suggest it's worth reviving today. Now, what's the worst that could happen? It could fail? Well, you know what? So has everything else. Right? Everything else we've tried has failed. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, and I, I don't want to get political here, but <laughs> there are still some people who think if I vote for some hand-picked candidate, hand-picked for me by the establishment, things will change. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, how many times, I almost feel like I want the establishment candidate to win just so that four years from now I, I can say, now look, <laughs> I told you this would happen, but yet the, the thing is that I've been doing this for years and it never seems to work. But enough of us are saying, something's got to be done. Now, let me just briefly, because I'm way, you know, we're, we're over time, let me just briefly say, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? What are the arguments they're going to make? They're going to say, this would be chaotic if the states nullified different laws. Because some states would do one thing and other states would do another thing. You know what the correct answer to that is? So what? That's the United States of America. The states are going to be different from each other. So what? What about the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution? The Supremacy Clause does not say, this Constitution, plus laws which shall be made in pursuance thereof, plus many old laws we might want to pass shall be the supreme law of the land. It does not say that. No one in his right mind would have ratified a Constitution that said that. So the issue is not the Supremacy Clause. The, the issue is, is this law pursuant to the Constitution? In which case it is the supreme law of the land, but that's the very question at issue. Now, I've talked in other talks, and we're sort of running out of time, about the issue of civil rights, because that does come up, and it's a legitimate question. But there you have a constitutional remedy in the enforcement of the 15th Amendment. And that, more than all the Supreme Court cases, solved all those problems. And at this point, so the southern states have seen black migration for 30 solid years. So this is not Birmingham 1963 anymore, and it's not fair to southerners to keep insulting them all the time and treating them as the one group who can be attacked constantly, and I say that as a person who's spent most of my life in the North, I think it's about time we leave the South alone. I mean, I think they've, they've, you know, they've been fairly honorable uh, for a good long time. But let's also remember what institution on Earth has been the most lethal in history for racial minorities? Well, the modern centralized state. I mean, a ask how, ask how the, the Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire were treated, or the Ukrainians in the Soviet Union or the Asians in Uganda, or of course the Jews in Germany. How did they like political centralization? Did, did they think that it was really helping racial minorities there? Every tyrant who ever lived wants centralized power and despises the idea of nullification. And I know that when you talk about issues like this, somebody inevitably brings up Hitler. I'm sorry to have to be that, that person. But if you read Mein Kampf, which most of us, I don't think are in the habit of doing, so I save you the trouble, in there, there is, an, there is a, a bit on states' rights, and Hitler is dead set against it. And that should not be a, a, a head-scratcher. You know, he's Hitler, right? I mean, well, he doesn't want some state to be able to defy him. His whole fascist view is that the nation needs to speak with one voice. Well, that's not what the United States is. The United States was supposed to be something different among the nations. Because at the time the United States was being born, there was already a trend towards centralization, and it would accelerate in the 19th century with the unification of Germany, the unification of Italy, centralization in Japan. It's going on everywhere. This idea that became mainstream in, in the West, that the only way you can organize political society is to have one irresistible power center ruling over a bunch of helpless individuals. 
But that wasn't the United States model. The United States looked to an older model, the older model in which Western liberty was born, the model in Europe whereby you didn't just have one irresistible power center telling everybody else what to do. You had all these small little associations in society, churches and cities and towns and guilds and universities, and they all had their privileges and immunities. They all had their liberties that they were going to defend. And so there was no power in society that could demand that they all conform because they were all ready to resist. They weren't just a bunch of isolated individuals. They had powers that came before the king's power. They had powers that came before the center's power, and that's how liberty came to Europe. Liberty came to Europe because after you got rid of the, Ro the Roman Empire fell, there was no continent-wide empire that replaced it. What you had was a whole bunch of tiny little principalities. And when all the, the principalities are tiny, it conduces to liberty. Because if you oppress people, all they gotta do is move 10 feet away. And that keeps the ambitions of princes limited. And so that's why it's important for us to, to, to remember, to think about, where is liberty most likely to be preserved today? In, under one giant jurisdiction or under a multiplicity of competing jurisdictions? Well, we are taught not to think that way. We're taught to think the 19th century and late 18th century French revolutionary heresy of political centralization is the only way of organizing society. The United States was an experiment in saying no to that. Because the United States, if you look in the Constitution, is never once referred to in the singular. It's never referred to in the singular. It's always referred to in the plural. Because that's what we are. What makes us great is not that we're a great big country. The Soviet Union was a great big country. China under Mao was a great big country. And tens of millions of people died. That doesn't make you great. And there are tiny little places on the globe that are wonderful and great places to live. Renaissance Florence was a wonderful place to live. It's not the size. It's the fact that we're a collection of societies, that we haven't yielded everything to the center, that we have retained corporate bodies like states that have powers of resistance, but those powers have lain dormant for too long. And so now it is time, I suggest, that we have the political imagination, not, thank goodness, to have to think of something from scratch, but to have the presence of mind and the courage to look back to our own tradition and say, no, this is not the way we're supposed to live. We are not supposed to live with over 300 million people accepting the infallible judgments of some king. No, we are supposed to be a free people. The world is full of centralized states, Germany, France, England, every, everywhere. The world has enough of those. Let's be the exception. Let's be the exception for liberty and be the beacon to the world to reverse this trend and bring back both liberty and civilization to the United States and to the world. Thank you very much.